I've had such a fun day today meeting with folks. Um, it's been really great to get to know the neighbors. Um, so thanks for being here and uh, for spending the time meeting with me today. Um, today I'm going to highlight a few key results from several uh, studies that we did using Trinidadian guppies as a model system to test the effects of gene flow on population fitness and demography. And at the end I'll include results from a recent pilot study that um, I think illustrates the need for a more sort of nuanced understanding of the relationship that we tend to think about between gene flow and maladaptation, especially in contemporary populations experiencing novel stress. So the classic and intuitive way that um, we think about gene flow and maladaptation as sort of going hand in hand, I think is characterized by this inverse relationship between the amount of gene flow and the level of adaptive divergence between populations and distinct environments. So the more gene flow you have, the less differentiated populations tend to be. To briefly illustrate this, if we have this population of fish adapted to a blue environment and gene flow occurs from fish adapted to a pink environment, the sort of intuitive outcome right, is that the introduction of these maladaptive pink alleles is going to reduce the fitness of that recipient population. And this constraining role of gene flow has received strong theoretical support in the context of migration load and migration selection balanced. And this inverse relationship um, between gene flow and adaptive divergen divergence has been documented in many well-known empirical systems. Again, more gene flow, less differentiation. So this has led to this sort of classic and dominant view that gene flow primarily acts as this constraining role that homogenize, homogenizes and limits adaptation. But here we are today um, at a time where changes to the earth are extreme and, and drastic enough to potentially warrant formal designation of a new Anthropocene epic, uh, where due to a variety of environmental stresses, populations um, are experiencing really extreme levels of maladaptation associated with global change uh, and vastly increased extinction rates. And as highlighted by this uh, photo here of this small habitat patch in a sea of citrus groves, many populations are um, being reduced and uh, as natural habitats and ecosystems are being divided and fragmented in the, into these smaller um, habitat fragments. So increasing these populations, vulnerability to small population problems problems like inbreeding depression. And we have ubiquitous evidence for negative fitness effects of inbreeding depression in the wild. At the same time, we're accumulating evidence suggesting that genetic rescue often works, at least in terms of providing sort of short-term benefits of gene flow into these small inbred populations. So one of the questions I want to, um, I hope to leave you thinking about at the end of this talk is whether we need to reconsider um, this sort of classic view that gene flow's primary, primary role is to constrain adaptation and um, yeah, whether we need this reconsideration of this relationship between gene flow and maladaptation uh, in today's populations. So I think studying fitness effects of gene flow in the context of genetic rescue is really exciting and um, powerful in part because it uh, directly links ecology and evolution by testing for a demographic effect uh, caused by a manipulation of an evolutionary process, namely gene flow. Um, so it sort of inherently links and is eco-evolutionary in that sense, even though we tend to think of eco-evodynamics as being sort of driven by selective forces, but I think these non-adaptive forces like drift and gene flow can also interact with ecology and genetic rescue is a really exciting, to me at least, uh, way of thinking about these interactions. Um, so the definition of genetic rescue that I use is an increase in population growth due to the immigration of new alleles by more than just the numerical or de demographic contribution of immigrants, so it's the genetic factors uh, that contribute to the population growth in this sense. There are a handful of iconic examples 
of genetic rescue from the conservation literature, the recovery of Florida panthers, bighorn sheep, European adders. Um, but this strategy, assisted migration and assisted gene flow for the purpose of genetic rescue is really not a widely used strategy in conservation and management. Um, but we are learning a lot more about how to predict successful genetic rescue from um, meta-analyses -anal like this paper by Dick Frankham that came out a couple years ago and through empirical work. So this is a, a Ruth Huffbauer's PNAS paper from 2015 um, showing rescue in flower beetles. And so today I'm going to talk about um, a body of work that I've been involved with that I think has also contributed to our understanding of genetic rescue and fitness effects of gene flow. So Trinidadian guppies have become a really well-known system uh, for studying rapid adaptation in the wild and studying the effects of these fish on the ecology of freshwater stream environments. Um, what great makes this island a great sort of natural test tube is the fact that these northern range mountains, which are actually the northernmost tip of the Andes, so Trinidad is a continental island, this is Venezuela. Um, this island, these mountains are drained by these independent replicated drainages on both the south and north slope of the island. And um, there's this predictable variation in the Pasivorous fish community of these drainages. So if you zoom into one of these rivers, this is the Guanapo River, you find this uh, predictable variation in how complex the fish community is as you get these uh, really complex high predation environments in the downstream lowland rivers and as waterfall barriers sort of punctuate these rivers and the predator community uh, reduces to a really simple low predation community in the headwaters. And then guppies are found throughout these environments and they've been found to um, evolve in really remarkably similar ways to variation in that, that preda predation community and the independent replicated drainages even when the predator communities are different. So the north and south slope has different sets of predators but the guppy phenotypes are predictable in spite of that difference in, in the actual fish themselves. So guppies from a high predation site, from a low predation site have evolved larger bodies and more color compared to their downstream counterparts in these high predation environments that are sort of torpedo sh shaped, built for speed, they've evolved reduced color. And this is true for a suite of different life history and morphological traits. Um, in, in many of these drainages throughout the island. The other um, sort of guppy Trinidad background that I want to tell you about that's relevant to the questions that I'm interested in is um, that many of these upstream headwater populations in the low predation environment um, often have really low levels of genetic variation. So they probably colonized by one or a few individuals that have somehow made it above one of these big waterfall barriers. So they have really low levels of variation. They're isolated from gene flow. Um, and I think they make good proxies for other small fragmented populations. All right, so that's the guppy setup. Um, now I'm going to uh, just highlight some results from gene flow manipulation experiments that we did in the wild in Trinidad uh, in this controlled common garden experiment in glass tanks at Colorado State and then a pilot experiment that just happened a few months ago uh, in these cattle tanks at KBS. So we'll start in Trinidad. So going back to this Guanapo River, um, this study centers on these two vocal populations in the Taylor and the Kaiwal River. These are native guppy populations that were at the upstream most extent of their range in these two uh, tributaries. They're presumably adapted to the low predation environment. Um, they start out with really low genetic variation. So this is heterozygosity. These are the two focal populations. Um, and this is compared to another set of low predation sites throughout the island in this um, population genetic study based on 10 microsatellites. So these two populations are really kind of at the extreme end of low uh, genetic variation. The original opportunity for this gene flow manipulation study 
stemmed from a project led by David Resnick and his colleagues in which guppies from this downstream high predation environment were introduced into two guppy-free reaches uh, upstream of, of the two focal populations that I just introduced you to. And these introduction sites themselves are an amazing ongoing long-term study um, looking at the effects of these introduced guppies on eco-evo dynamics in, in the stream and a large body of really impressive literature that can be found on their project site. Um, what it did for us was set up this really nice opportunity to test the effects of new gene flow from an originally divergent source into these uh, native recipient populations. And I just want to acknowledge my collaborators on this project, Chris Fung, Lisa Angeloni, Dale Broder, and John Cronenberger. Um, so to test the effects of gene flow and population dynamics and fitness, I conducted a large-scale mark recapture and genetic monitoring study, censusing those two focal sites, the Taylor and Kaiwal populations, for 29 consecutive months, uh, three of which were occurred prior to those upstream introductions. Um, and in total, we monitored close to 10,000 individuals in this study. And this is, of course, um, would have been entirely impossible without the help of a lot of great field assistants, including perhaps a familiar face here. A good friend Mike Grunler caught a lot of guppies, but couldn't keep them away from the snakes. Um, and then I just talked to somebody else who was an intern on the Resnick project upstream. So um, I think that's another cool feature of this project that uh, has trained a lot of uh, future evolutionary biologists and ecologists and the got their start with guppies. To paint the scene of what this mark recapture entails, um, we monitor about 100 to 200 meters of stream, and the goal is to catch every single guppy that's larger than 14 millimeters, so about the width of your thumbnail. So we catch all these fish, uh, bottle them in Nalgene's, hike them back up to our field lab, um, and house them separately by sex and, and location in the stream. Um, all fish each month are weighed and photographed and recorded. New recruits to the population receive a unique elastomer tattoo and have a few scales sampled for DNA extraction. Um, and then these fish are then rebottled, hiked back down to the stream, and released to the exact pool where they were captured just a few days before. Um, so we do this every month. And Resnick's project is still ongoing, so it's kind of amazing that yeah, that's a really cool data set. Um, so to cut to the chase here, uh, we observed really large population, increases in population size in both of these streams following the onset of gene flow. Uh, so both populations started out under 100 individuals each before gene flow, and by the end of the study, they were nearly 10 times as large. And you can see these fluctuations here um, that we expect based on seasonality in Trinidad. So in the wet season, floods and um, low resource environments because it's cloudy all the time, uh, basically knock down guppy populations everywhere. So you see these sort of typical reductions in the wet season, but you see these successive increases in each, um, in each successive wet season. So it's really been this sustained increase in population size following the onset of gene flow. And I have this gray box here uh, to note the time period in which we genotyped every individual caught and um, sampled in that, that period of time. So we genotyped these individuals at 12 microsatellite loci, uh, so just over 3,000 fish with the two streams combined in this window of time. And this is spans about four guppy generations uh, following gene flow. And man, I would love to extend that box out further, but that's where we had to stop. Uh, so this figure shows the uh, temporal introduction and spread of immigrant and hybrid genotypes during this period of time where we genotyped every individual. The colors here correspond to a continuous hybrid index that each guppy was assigned. So the, pu the, the purple color here is, um, corresponds to the pure native genotype 
and the red is the pure immigrant genotype. And so you can see, and then the y-axis is essentially population size. It's the number of genotyped individuals, um, which is pretty close to the number of total fish caught that month. So you can see the um, sort of slow trickle of immigration, um, at least slow in the Kaiwal, and then spread of hybrid genotypes um, by the end of this, this time frame. You can see that the rates of gene flow were pretty different in these two sites. So the Taylor uh, focal site was pretty much back to back from that upstream introduction. So it just got uh, pummeled by all of these immigrants getting uh, washed downstream into our study. Whereas in the Kaiwal, there was about uh, seven or 800 meters of stream in between. And so gene flow is um, slower in that stream. Um, to get at who is sort of contributing to these increases in population size, we first used a mark recapture modeling framework um, to compare survival rates of different hybrid groups. In this case, the colors correspond to these sort of discrete hybrid uh, or discrete genetic ancestry classes. Uh, so again, the, uh, in this case, the light blue is the native genotype, red is immigrant, and then four different hybrid classes. And so if you look within um, these populations, survival rates are pretty similar um, across gene genetic ancestry, but it was really these differences in recruitments where hybrids had much higher recruitment rates than uh, both parental uh, genotypes. So this sort of was suggestive of um, hybrids having higher fitness here, but then we also used that microsatellite data to reconstruct wild pedigrees for these populations. Um, and to actually estimate lifetime reproductive success for every individual. Uh, so this spider web thing is the pedigree where each level is a generation and the uh, blue lines are connecting males, male guppies to their offspring, red lines are connecting females to their offspring. Um, and so for example, for any given individual, you can see how many offspring were assigned to um, him throughout its life and so this male had a lifetime reproductive success of four. Individual fitness estimates ranged from zero to 53. So the rock star guppy in our case uh, was this female who had 53 offspring assigned to her. What a badass. Um, we see this, this sort of commonly found uh, highly skewed distribution where most individuals had either zero or really low levels of fitness. Um, and so this plot is showing individuals from uh, the entire pedigree, and then this is just individ uh, showing uh, individuals that had at least one offspring, just to sort of better show this distribution here. And then going back to this continuously assigned hybrid index, we tested for a relationship between an individual's hybrid index and its total lifetime reproductive success. And I'm just showing you results from the Taylor here, but both streams looked, looked really similar where the uh, quadratic relationship outperformed the linear fit and the, the maxima are noted here uh, by the x's. So in general, the more immigrant-like genotypes had higher fitness, but it was um, these hybrids, F1 immigrant bat cross hybrids with a hybrid index around 0.7 to 0.8 that uh, contributed, that had the highest fitness values and likely contributed to the increases in population size that we saw beyond this window. And to um, confirm that, so the pedigree data was based on that you know, gray box, first four generations after gene flow. Um, I collected RADSeq data to look at whole genome patterns of gene flow, including looking at sort of getting a genome-wide estimate of hybrid index after 10 generations following gene flow. And so that's sampled a randomly sampled subset 10 generations after the introduction. And interestingly, so this is genome-wide average, the hybrid index corresponds pretty closely to this uh, zone that produced the individuals with the really high fitness. So sort of further evidence that these individuals continue to do well and contribute disproportionately to the uh, further increases in population size. So based on these sustained increases in population size caused by high hybrid fitness, 
Uh, we found strong evidence that genetic rescue occurred in both of these populations. Um, and this was somewhat surprising given that the uh, source of gene flow is coming from this adaptively divergent source. So that's um, kind of in contrast to this idea that gene flow plays this more um, uh, constraining role. But there, uh, and there's a lot to say about the nuances of this story. I'm going to just talk about a full few bullet points here. Oops, this is two at once. Um, first of all, there's a whole story about what happened to the traits in these streams. Uh, we measured traits in the wild and found that the locally the LP phenotype was maintained in the wild, but then we measured the same traits in the common garden and found really mixed results where some uh, phenotypes measured in a common garden seem to be uh, now much more similar to the source site. Um, so it suggests that plasticity is potentially playing a role at maintaining uh, these locally adaptive traits in the wild. Um, second point is that the environment really matters for this sort of scenario. A uh, previous study has done the flip side of the introduction where they've introduced LP low predation fish into high predation environments. And as you would expect, there was no gene flow documented in that case because these big, slow, low predation guppies just were obliterated by the predators in that case. So immigrants have to actually persist and survive in the environment in order for gene flow to occur at all. Um, another uh, sort of philosophical issue to point out here is how much gene flow is too much. Is uh, as a manager, would you look at what happened to the tailor here and call that uh, gene swamping? And did we lose the sort of uh, local genetic signature of these populations? Um, maybe we did. I think looking at uh, whole genome data can be really informative for that kind of question because it's possible that loci that are underlying these locally adaptive traits, which are being maintained in the wild, um, are hanging on in this population despite sort of genome-wide uh, introgression. And then also uh, time since divergence between the recipient and source population is also a really uh, relevant thing to consider here. So in this case, the, the source population, even though it was from this adaptively divergent environment, it came from a downstream drainage that was relatively um, closely related to the upstream site. And so you might expect different results if you're crossing two populations from the opposite side of the, the Northern Range Mountains, or clearly if you're bringing together lineages that, are, that have been um, evolving separately for a much longer time, um, you might not see this sort of benefit of gene flow that we saw here. Uh, but one thing that is really great about guppies is that we can sort of tease out some of these questions that we have about what predicts uh, successful genetic rescue versus an outbreeding situation. And so uh, we were interested in looking at um, the effects of different immigrant types on predicting fitness of gene flow. And so to do this, we set up this controlled and replicated lab experiment this effort was led by John Cronenberger, who was a master's student at CSU, and his paper just uh, was accepted in conservation biology a few weeks ago, so check that out. Um, so for this experiment, we collected low predation guppies from Trinidad and seeded populations in these 10-gallon glass aquaria with 16 individuals each. Our environment was held constant including food quantity, so even if population sizes changed, we kept the amount of resources they were getting consistent. And so the goal here, like I said, was to test these different um, sort of augmentation scenarios on population fitness. So each recipient population was augmented with either nothing, so a no gene flow treatment, or immigrants from the exact same population, and this is to control for demographic rescue or immigrants from one of three other sources for a total of these five augmentation treatments. We included two low predation treatments. So these immigrants are phenotypically similar to the recipient, but they vary in how 
uh, genetically different they were, at least based on neutral mic microsatellite loci. And then one HP treatment where the phenotypes are differentiated from the recipient, but it came from the downstream site, so more sort of neutrally, genetically similar. Uh, and that, this is the scenario that um, mimics what we, the scenario that we had in the wild. And we replicated this design using two sets of recipient and donor populations in Trinidad. And I just wanted to point out that the recipient population on the south slope, the core A population, had a smaller starting effective population size than the recipient in the, on the north slope, the Marianne. But we'll come back to that. All right, so John sampled these tanks every two months. Uh, he let the first six months go, just let the populations um, sort of stable out on their own. And then there was this uh, year-long aug augmentation period where every two months he introduced one male and one virgin female to the population, and then monitored populations for another full year after that uh, augmentation period. Every time a tank was censused, all fish were counted, photographed, new recruits were given the unique marks, similar um, marking and monitoring methods as the uh, wild experiment, had tissues sampled for DNA extraction, that whole thing. All right, so these are means and confidence intervals for heterozygosity and allelic richness in the core A population, the core A recipient population, and these are the five different augmentation treatments. And so this is um, sort of exactly what you'd predict where the no gene flow treatment just has this sort of steady decline of in genetic variation over time. Um, and yeah, the gene flow treatments are maintaining sort of higher variation, but still get this kind of decline overall. This is compared to the Marianne, which uh, first of all starts out with higher variation. That's similar to what we saw with the effective population sizes. And the differences in loss of, of variation are less extreme in this Marianne drainage. So first I'm going to show you abundance trajectories for each uh, replicate tank. Um, so each black line here is, is the abundance of a single glass tank in the different uh, augmentation scenarios here. Anything that hits this red line went extinct. And so in the core, we had a total of five tanks go extinct, two from the no gene flow, two from the same, and one from this LP close treatment. And then if you average these abundances, um, over the three, the three replicate tanks, uh, you can just see this sort of steady decline in the same and no gene flow, yeah, same and no gene flow treatments uh, compared to the tanks that did receive gene flow. And these are the estimated marginal means, taking into account other uh, factors that were included in the model. And so we did find evidence for genetic rescue in this core A population. For the Marianne, um, had some extinction, but not as uh, severe as the Core, so uh, three tanks total went extinct here. And showing you these similar averages of, of abundance, it's um, pretty inconsistent in terms of the no gene flow in same uh, tanks. In some cases did better than the gene flow tra treatments, and in some cases did worse, so we did not find consistent evidence for genetic rescue in this Marianne population. And again, the quarry was the, the population with the smaller starting population size. Uh, so th I think this fits predictions about how smaller populations that experience higher genetic drift are um, stand to benefit more from these immediate uh, effects of gene flow um, compared to, yeah, the Marianne that has this larger effective population size. All right, so um, at this point, John was really ready to be done with these guppies. He'd already left to go hike the uh, PCT. I was setting up my lab at KBS and was starting to realize that these uh, populations that we had so much information about their recent ev evolutionary history could be useful for future experiments. So after the evolution conference last summer, I shipped these guppies um, to myself in Michigan, at least a subset. So I took uh, guppies from a subset of these treatments shown by the arrows here, 
and um, took them to Michigan to start setting up experiments in my own lab. So we'll move on to these mesocosms. And so, to be honest, my first goal this summer was just to generate larger population sizes so that I would have individuals to work with to set up future experiments. So, yeah, really uh, all I wanted was guppies to be guppies and populations to increase. But I thought I could do this in a more controlled and uh, replicated design to potentially collect some interesting data along the way. So I set up these cattle tanks, 24 tanks inoculated with zooplankton and macroinvertebrates from local ponds, seeded each tank with four individuals, um, and then replicated each of these gene flow history treatments four times. So I had um, no gene flow treatments from both Corey and Marianne, HP gene flow treatments from both populations, and then uh, one LP gene flow treatment for, for, for the Corey. And the uh, sort of question I was, um, had the idea to ask was, does recent evolutionary history um, gene flow from these different sources versus no gene flow predict variation in individual and population growth rates um, in this novel high resource environment that they're um, introduced to. And then my bonus question, um, KBS is uh, well known for its uh, aquatic community ecology and um, so I, I was careful about inoculating the tanks with sort of equal uh, or the same inoculum, and so my idea was to test whether recent evolutionary history predicts variation in community diversity and function as well. And that's why I have these four no fish controls here. All right, so my technician and I sampled these tanks every two weeks, collected the same type of data that I've um, told you about before, counting all fish in different size and age classes, taking photographs, marking new recruits, and sampling DNA. Showing you female growth rates here, focusing on females because guppy females have indeter indeterminate growth. Um, so what you can see is that the no gene flow treatments in both Marianne and Corey had lower growth rates than the gene flow treatments. And even though this, these environments were uh, high resource um, environments, the no gene flow individuals uh, seem to be at a disadvantage here in terms of growth rates. And I, I think this is somewhat interesting for the Marianne given that we didn't see these consistent genetic rescue benefits, but suddenly in this new novel environment, um, these no gene flow females seem to be um, at somewhat of a dif uh, disadvantage. In terms of abundances, each um, black line here again is the sort of abundant trajectory of a single tank. In this case, the red line is uh, anything at or above the red line is a stable or growing population. So all tanks started with four individuals. These are the different sample occasions. Um, so I'm just showing you the no gene flow treatments here. And the Marianne is uh, doing better than the Corey, which is what you'd pr predict based on the John's previous experiment. And then adding the gene flow treatments here. Um, so yeah, in general, Marianne is, is doing better than the Corey, but the gene flow populations are growing at faster rates than the no gene flow. So I was kind of uh, excited. I mean, it's sort of what I predicted. It was exciting. I, these populations were getting bigger. This is just adult abundance, but these tanks were also filled with babies. So I was kind of like, great, things are going well. Um, we had this really warm fall, 80 degree weather through September. So I was just sort of content to let things go on. Um, but then I woke up one morning feeling like a little chilly and like I needed an extra blanket. And then suddenly, yeah, just got this pit in my stomach and checked the weather and it had gotten down to 40 degrees that night. And uh, went out to the pond lab, checked the water temperature, and it had gotten to 11 degrees Celsius, which is about five degrees below the known CT minimum for guppies. So that was a bummer. Um, <laughs> confirmed the really creative prediction that tropical fish are maladapted to temperate environments. Um, so yeah, mass mortality here. Uh, 
13 tanks experienced 100% mortality of all individual, 88% of all individuals died from this cold exposure. And so this was a pretty terrible day, just like scooping guppy carcasses that were supposed to become my preliminary data for my next NSF proposal. I was feeling like, oh, sorry for myself. And then started realizing that um, there were some survivors. And of the eight tanks that um, had at least one survivor, six of them were from this gene flow treatment. So 45 guppies lived from this cold uh, exposure. And the majority of these surviving individuals and highest survival rates uh, for both drainages were from the HP gene flow treatments. So replicated, remember the HP gene flow, th these are separate HP populations that provided gene flow into these two drainages. So sort of independently replicated in these two um, source recipient populations. And I think one of the big picture messages that I'm excited about is that in the Marianne, even though in John's study we didn't see these immediate fitness benefits of gen genetic rescue, when these fish were then exposed to a novel environment, first the high resource environment, we saw this sort of disadvantage um, with the no gene flow individuals. And then they're blasted with this really novel and extreme stress and the gene flow populations persist at higher rates than the no gene flow. So um, I think this suggests potential sort of longer term benefits to gene flow beyond uh, what we think about as genetic rescue providing um, a recovery from inbreeding depression, but I think this suggests that this variation provided by gene flow has sort of longer, potentially longer term, or the benefits might not show up until uh, sort of this stress happens. Um, so my goal, goal here is to follow up on this opportunity. I'm still working out the uh, details here, so if I'd love to get feedback if anybody has thoughts, but um, the goal is to directly test whether gene flow provided the variation that reduced extinction risk in these tanks. So the plan is to pool DNA from these two sort of phenotypes, dead versus alive, get really high coverage whole genome resequencing data, screen for the alleles that are uh, the loci that are most highly divergent between those two phenotypes, and those become your um, sort of candidate survival or cold tolerance alleles. Um, so you have, hopefully, have a set of these candidate alleles. And then what's really cool is that we have, because John carefully archived all of this tissue from every single individual in the recipient population and every immigrant individual, we can then screen those individuals at your candidate survival alleles to test whether gene flow provided those survival alleles or if they existed in the recipient populations as standing variation. But I think given that the vast majority of survivors came from these HP uh, populations that had received gene flow from the HP uh, sites, suggests that these are the populations that are providing, if, if the candidate alleles exist, um, suggests that they were provided by that, um, that gene flow treatment. And so the, the overall point here is not to say that guppies in Trinidad are going to be in need of cold tolerance alleles anytime soon, but that gene flow, I think, uh, might become this increasingly important source of variation as populations continue to get pushed further and further beyond their limits, and that this classic view of gene flow as causing maladaptation might not be the predominant pattern that we um, observe in contemporary populations under these stressful conditions. And so this brings me back to this question of whether or not we, we should reconsider the relationship between gene flow and maladaptation in contemporary populations. Um, I think experiments like the ones I talked about today and what other groups are doing with flower beetles and brook trout are really helping us understand the nuances of the conditions underlying these different gene flow fitness scenarios uh, and when gene flow does sort of produce these fitness benefits versus um, cause maladaptation. So these experiments allow us to answer questions like uh, how much gene flow is too much, um, yeah, understanding how the levels of, dr of drift and inbreeding and recipient populations and how that interacts with um, the, um, the fitness response that you see to gene flow. 
uh, levels of divergence from source and recipient, stability of the environment, that sort of thing. So that's why I'm keeping guppies in, in the, the toolkit. I think experiments are good for that. Uh, I think genomics are also starting to tell us a lot about gene flow in terms of locus specific introgression patterns. Uh, so we used to use microsatellites to just get these sort of genome wide averages of gene flow, but now we can actually look at what are the chunks of the genome that are being introduced and staying versus ones that are sort of selected against. Um, so a lot more sort of mechanistic, also in terms of understanding the geno genomic architecture of how genetic rescue works. Is it just genome-wide heterozygosity that increases fitness, or is it really the introduction of these few large effect, high fitness, loci, that sort of thing? Um, but then finally, I also uh, really agree with this call for a paradigm shift in how we think about conservation and management of small imperiled populations. So this paper argues that rather than inaction, the default should be to evaluate um, the possibility of restoring gene flow and connectivity into small inbred populations, <coughs> at least of diploid outbreeding organisms um, that have been isolated by human activities. So that, that should be sort of the default as opposed to keeping these tiny inbred populations around for the sake of, um, I don't know what, preserving local, um, yeah, native genetic signature, but um, yeah, if they're going extinct anyway, I think that's a problem. So I'm, uh, in addition to the gut B toolkit, I am um, thinking about and design the design and implementation of genetic rescue for conservation purposes and, and several species of, of concern. So these Arkansas darters that are found in Great Plains streams, uh, tributaries that are drying up um, as groundwater removal uh, happens and drought throughout the Great Plains. Uh, so I have a postdoc in my lab, Brendan Reed, who's conducting this large scale landscape genomic study to sort of inform managers of um, recipient populations that might be most genetically imperiled or highest levels of inbreeding in these populations. So basically to screen for the sort of best candidates for genetic rescue that need this infusion of gene flow the most, and also to screen for the right source populations that you can use to infuse those populations. So maybe trying to minimize divergence at like putatively adaptive loci, but that still provides neutral genetic variation. So that's our goal there with these darters. And then I'm also working with a group on Florida scrub jays. Uh, this species really fits the bill in terms of uh, populations that could benefit from assisted gene flow. Nancy Chen and others have done really impressive work showing that um, these scrub jay populations are vulnerable to inbreeding depression and documenting fitness boosts when natural migration happens. Um, and then you have all these tiny populations on the coast of Florida that are uh, going extinct, and even when the habitat is there. So even when Florida scrub habitat is preserved and there's enough habitat for birds to be persisting and they're still going extinct, it's pretty suggestive that uh, there's some genetic factors at play with those declines. So we're in the process of setting up um, pre-augmentation monitoring for some of these coastal populations and also screening some of the largest populations in Florida and this Ocala National Forest and Archibald Biological Station to ideally screen for individuals that will become the um, source individuals for translocation. So things like screening for overall highest heterozygosity, maybe choosing like MHC loci or some loci that you think are important for um, fitness in these birds so that we can do this, help managers do this action in a more informed way. Um, so that's what I do and that's what keeps me up at night when I'm not uh, I'm trying to ignore local and national politics. Um, thanks very much for listening. I think we should have plenty of time for questions here. Thanks. Yeah. 
Yeah, so high color, a lot of the traits that are locally favored in that environment were maintained in spite of this high gene flow. And that was one of the surprising findings to us. So not only were the population sizes, uh, not only did they grow, that the locally favored traits were also maintained, at least in the wild. Um, so that is kind of cool. But then when we did a common garden experiment looking at sort of the genetic uh, basis of those traits, that wasn't necessarily the case. So they were maturing at smaller sizes. They had more traits that were more similar to the typical hybridation site. So I think there's some gene flow plasticity interaction happening in the wild that's maintaining really locally favored traits, but um, the underlying genetic architecture of how those traits are built, we, we haven't, we don't understand yet. Yeah, yeah, that's a really good question. I wish I knew the answer to that. I'm sure it varies a lot case by case. Um, I think there's a lot of evidence for heterozygote, heterozygote advantage, so higher heterozygosity in general, I think, is better for fitness, but there's probably cases where there's been fixation of some really deleterious allele and as soon as you mask that one allele, you're doing a lot better than before. So um, yeah, I stay tuned. It would be fun to understand more generally um, how these benefits are working like at that level. Yeah. Uh-huh. So after gene flow, if yeah, the population, uh huh, yeah, right, right. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I guess it depends on the relationship between gene flow and selection and those periods of. Yeah, um, I mean, that's a great question because I, I, I don't know if, if clearly selection is happening when you have these high mortality events, there's a wet season, most fish die, then what's allowing that subsequent increase? I think it'd be cool to see if uh, allele frequency changes at that point were if it was variation provided by gene flow that's, that um, then is sort of responding to these post-selective increases. Um, hmm. Yeah, I don't know. I'll have to think about that more. That's a good question. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That is really typical to the same thing, which is gene flow. Hmm. Oh. Right, right. Uh-huh. Yeah, sorry, because 
at least in the lab study, you know, we did test, it's not like it was only one right. type, but we never do the reciprocal. Yeah, so you're reciprocal thinking more about the reciprocal, yeah. Uh-huh. It's not I this. I think that in this case, you wouldn't see much of an effect, at least, well, I think it depends on which recipient. Yeah, I think it depends a lot on the characteristics of the population receiving gene flow, because these guys are like super variable already. They have a ton of variation. I don't know if they need more. Um, but I think that is a question um, that like people thinking about this in conservation are thinking about is, Inbred crossed with inbred, good, yeah, does that do any good? I, I think in terms of masking deleterious alleles, it might if they're fixed for different alleles. But yeah, I, I think that's a really important question. Is it gene flow per se, or is it specific alleles? And um, mm -hmm. Yeah, well, Andrew Hendry said something to me recently that sort of along these lines where he was like, like, is this, I think he was asking a similar question, is it, do we need to think, change our, the way we think about gene flow, period, or is it just these populations are highly drifted and that's when gene flow matters? And I think that's kind of the, um, I don't know if that's related yeah, to what you're wondering, but. Mm -hmm. I was, I've been wondering about um, heterozygosity, like this population that's already got a lot of heterozygosity, has the variation exposed, and then get reach the same level of heterozygosity through gene flow, where you have all these sort of new genetic combinations and epistatic interactions potentially expose those to some stress. Like, yeah, is it heterozygosity that matters, or is it this new? Uh-huh. Yeah, right. So, yeah. Well, you mentioned that the length of time since the divergence of population is just the technical factor. Mm -hmm. So if you were to take uh, populations of pinfish for Darwin's pinfish in different islands and put them in a, a third environment, then the environmental uh, factors would determine uh, whether the hybrid could be more successful, probably, than Mm -hmm. In terms of in terms of trying to keep them in function. Right. But with hybridization or with or you're saying I don't know how you yeah. accomplish hybridization. Yeah. But the way that a time of divergence mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well I think in some of these cases, um, either the source the ideal source population doesn't exist because it already went extinct or it never existed. Um, or populations, yeah, there's some conversation about crossing subspecies or even species to increase heterozygosity and that, that's where territory that makes me really nervous and I think that's a really different scenario than crossing these populations that are, yeah, have share much Recent, more recent ancestor. Um, I mean, I don't know how you restore heterozygosity when you don't have the right source. That's, yeah, CRISPR. <laughs> <laughs>